creeds that we use as a term in this work are only happen when there is a switch to the autonomic function of the nervous system. So in other words, this is where the, any mental activity is overrun and something else is in play. So this is the quickest answer to distinguish what is Kriya with regard to involuntarily movements, not movements done. I have a question about the spontaneous uh, kriyas. How how do you differentiate from an authentic spontaneous kriya to a like contrived maybe like uh, an act? And uh, <clears throat> okay, that's interesting one. Let's let's take a different stab at it because it's been covered. Mm -hmm. It's really been, I mean, we have a whole playlist. We could make our own playlist with this topic over the years. So I think I will welcome this as an opportunity to give it another stamp, precisely from where you're coming from, because I find it interesting. Because when people who never had Kriya's question, and it is down to the ridiculous, just between us boys here and girls too, um, at one of the aforementioned gatherings, science and non-duality conferences many, many years ago, we had this spontaneous uh, occurrence. There. In fact, it was produced and was known as an underground recording, which almost went cult in a sense of its impact. <clears throat> there was a bunch of very well-known teachers around some of whom were not in a shot. If you're interested, you can still find it on Buddha the Gas Pump as an audio. And it, was, it became known as a patio talk. We did a run for the panel, which I was on with, I don't want to go into details, I don't want to name, because some of these people are not even alive, sadly. And I was on a panel with two other teachers, female and male who then became sex tra transgender and Rick Archer who organized the panel and we were just sitting outside and we thought we we're just going to go over things but very quickly <clears throat> a lot of guys and you know, girls gathered around and it was a lot of youth as well and just happened it just happened that when I started to speak about that it just like really went uh, a lot of Resonance versus antagonisms versus became very, very charged. Some teachers of real, um, yeah, very well known, uh, who had like belonged to the, the pioneers of the non duality movement, even chipped in with their own perspective. And at that very gathering, one of the teachers with whom I shared the panel said, I never had Kriyas. And, um, and it just flew out of me. Well, there's no awakening without Kriya. <clears throat> so, because really what we speak about here is very clear. How do we distinguish what is Kriya in the way we use that term in this work? And I hope if you have watched some of the videos, more recent ones, produced in the past couple of years, let's say, maybe a bit more, two to four years, when a distinction is always made between what we call Kriyas in this work and how Kriyas are known in spiritual circles. Because the term Kriyas came into wide use already with someone like Paramahamsa Yogananda, who brought Kriya Yoga of Sri Yuktisvar, right? If you remember that kind of whole thing, is that the term Kriya was already in use in Southern California back in the days when Paramahamsa Yogananda lived at such 
impact <clears throat> in the landscape of the, certainly in the United States. And it wasn't used even today. And it, there's some offshoots and all of them use the term Korea, but it's not Korea in the sense of how we use this term here. Nor is it a Korea as how it is used in the language of the Kundalini Yoga trademark established by Yogi Bhajan. They do movements and call them Kriyas. They do them. In other words, they are voluntarily. The word Kriya is a Sanskrit word for movement, action. We can go into that when we will revisit the sketches we did started today <clears throat> to kind of like superimpose more of that onto that structure because we will inevitably have to speak about will, knowledge and action how that fits into that equilateral, into that triangle of the trigger, Shaivism. So Kriya is simply that, simply is the notes here uh, in Sanskrit, in how it is used, action. So we use the term Kriya, <clears throat> excuse me, consciously from get going with reference to the involuntary processes only. So we don't do anything. It will take some time to really unravel what is it that you actually do here if you don't do anything. It's not that straightforward. So this, I think it will be very good if we really revisit that, where you go with the flow and where you apply effort, what is actually happening here in terms of one's prerequisite. Is it enough to just relax and surrender and let go and accept? Will then everything unfold on its own? So I'm just kind of throwing it all into the mix. Perhaps some of you will be willing to bring this out into the open. But going back to your, let's say, uh, curiosity, right? <clears throat> curiosity, whether this is like you, your inquiry, your query, whether this is true, whether, how do you know? Am I doing it or is it doing itself? So now... The simplest response to that can be from the perspective of how our neurophysiology functions. It's simply down to the respective activities of the nervous system. So the autonomic nervous system, which run as you, you know, the basic knowledge is we know, right? Autonomic nervous system is responsible for all these activities in the body, which we don't do. They happen on their own, starting with breathing, swallowing, digestion, blinking of an eyes, everything. All these activities are not activities that require any mental involvement of whatsoever. In other words, it happens by itself. It belongs to the part of the nervous system which is known as, as autonomic, right? What is autonomic nervous system comprised of? Like, what is the function or? Yeah, like to the basic basics. The heart? Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, everything. Exactly, Cir you're right. Circulation, right? The heart activity, obviously. Respiratory activity, all this. So, Kriyas that we use as a term in this work are only happen when there is a switch to the autonomic function of the nervous system. So in other words, this is where the, any mental activity is overrun and something else is in play. So this is the quickest answer to distinguish what is Kriya with regard to involuntarily movements, not movements done. And this makes it a radically different. This is why in a way maybe we should sit down and come up with another term. Because a lot of people when they hear that and then they hear and we 
short attention span is we all can be held accountable these days uh, cannot be blamed for because it's really there's a lot out there that our attention is overwhelmed with so that deficit disorder it's like we all slightly touched by this disease so this so as people hear Kriya, yeah, of course, yeah, Kriya, ah, Kundalini, yeah, like instantly everyone is suddenly knows what we're talking about. And, oh, okay, they do these things. No, not, this work is not based on any doing. And the whole magic of this, in a way, the whole uh, beauty of beauty, why not to use that term? Is because it is not something that we do. A predisposition is there. A container is created. And by hook or by crook, one way or another, this is what's happening right now in the world. And it is at an accelerating rate. Whether this is a more due to the tremendous exchange of information and things become more known quickly. <clears throat> Whether there is, there is a, uh, definitely some ratio of where we can speak of awakening as a chain reaction, that's a subject of speculation. But we can certainly attest that there is much more common now that what only 50 years ago was not so common when it comes to these awakening processes. There's a lot of people out there report this. A lot of it, of course, and you know what's interesting is that this, since it belongs to the activity of autonomic nervous system, then it doesn't even preclude that it will happen to those who are involved in spiritual practices or practices that somehow are linked to pan-Indian, Vedic, yogic uh, heritage, tradition. It happens to people in Catholicism, in Protestant background, in Gnostic, in Agnostic. It happens to people who are atheists. It happens to people in various different Buddhists. And it's very uncomfortable because they straight they run into the conflict with the body of knowledge and certain let's say ethos that exists in the work. There are some classical examples. I'm kind of like the one to regurgitate too much. I've spoken about over the years how so and so this and that person had to reconcile the whole career, spiritual career, when the true awakening took place because it was not part of their tradition or there are no immediate allusions where one can draw from. Physically, suddenly, suddenly you are entered into the totally a gray area, uncharted waters. Everything was speak and span <laughs> until it was not. And suddenly it overrides everything. And it overrides to such a degree that one cannot sit in a zazen anymore. Zazen finished. Hit me with a stick, whatever. Break your stick on my back. I will break the whole house. I'll burn the house down with the fire in my belly now. That's the story. This is what's happening. So healthy skepticism is always good. But I would also suggest that you apply this with regard to every area, you know, question everything. That it's a good approach to, to know exactly what's happening and why is it happening. So, also there are simple ways of how to test that. You can resist slightly. And the Kriya, whatever the Kriya is, resist. And then relax and see what happens. See? So it's almost like you can even have mental predisposition. I'm going to sit down now and have a very 
still meditation. I'm not going to move. I'm just going to sit still like a Buddha in that garden, like the sculpture, with the fountain and, you know, like really feeling good about myself. And the next thing, I'm rolling all over the floor and I'm no longer that Buddha from the garden. I'm this laughing, fat, belly Buddha, right? Who's just rolling on his big tummy like panda, uh, you know, in, in ecstasy of uh, reveling in all that. So, but it's a good idea to uh, consider tweaking that Kriya in relation to because it's. We use that and take it for granted and kind of just moving on with that. But it's an involuntary, it's not something in that one can even do. And in many cases that people do things when they are in that state that they cannot do in, let's say, waking state when they are not in, in that transported state. They can, with the vocalization, from from the vocalization to to physical postures to f- precision of the mudras. So, so pranayamas. Yeah, it's um, like coming to a retreat it's just uh difficult for for to be spontaneous it's like because it just seems like how do you turn it on like when the, you say go and then people just turn it on like that it just it just makes me skeptical well it's not turning on let's now give it in, in another angle so why Kriyas? This is something that has been covered. Why? Why are there Kriyas? What for? See? So, Tantra has very rich body of knowledge when it comes to these processes that could be spoken in terms of esoteric anatomy or spiritual anatomy of the process. So it's something that is literally has the anatomy, can be studied. It is studied. It is looked into. Some of it floats to the surface, becomes domain of the public enterprise, becomes a staff of... uh, collectively shared consensus, speaking of chakras and how all that in new age just incorporated all that. It's not as straightforward and it's much more refined, complex and interesting even. <clears throat> it's not just like rainbow body, this and that. We can look into this. The Kundalini course that was delivered is was precisely an attempt to separate wit from the chaff to what is it actually, what chakra is, where the term chakra comes from, what it represents. Why do we think of chakras in terms of flowers, lotuses, petals? See, all these are layers that came later on. Tantric knowledge was direct first-hand experience conveyed for the purpose of introducing the initiates into the intricacies of the process so that they can verify this through direct experiences. Sometimes to position them to work with certain energy centers. <clears throat> we can, for example, are you familiar with, with this, uh, canonical text and Patanjali Yoga Sutras? No. No. But you said you've been around the block. Well, in an experiential way. Okay. Because it's a, it's a very well-known scripture. Patanjali Sutras is a very slim work. In, 
arguably considered to be the most authoritative text on on yoga, not on asanas, because it doesn't have any description of asanas whatsoever. It simply deals with the very <clears throat> philosophy of yoga, what, feel, what yoga is, and it is rooted in the Samkhya, dualistic philosophy, which deals with Purusha and Prakriti. Even in Patanjali Sutras, we can find these precise traces of all this anatomical, spiritual anatomy in the biggest chapter known as Vibhuti Pada, which deals with psychic powers, literally how to develop psychic powers. It deals with all that. It can be viewed <clears throat> as that particular exposition on what is taking place at the internal level. So we can speak about this and view the Kriyas as the language that is pertinent to the pranic processes that are inseparable from pretty much what we are. The activity of the human body in like crashed course in Ayurveda at that level <clears throat> would have to be to hear the uh, how the five major pranas function in the body, giving the body that what we take for granted, let's say, uh, in terms of bodily functioning. So governed by these pranic forces. It's the domain of the knowledge which doesn't exist in allopathic medicine, doesn't exist in Western current medicine. There are some counterparts in only in the precision of that, only in Chinese medicine, the knowledge of the meridians, which acupressure and the science of acupuncture is based on. So the <clears throat> functioning of these pranas, these five pranic currents, is all there is. And altogether, this is what comprises the entire full gamut of activity, from all these basics to the expression of creativity, speech, the ability to imagine things, bring the things to manifestation. <clears throat> so the yogic understanding or tantric understanding of what keeps everything intact in terms of settled state of affairs, let's say status quo, that spiritual work supposed to overthrow, at least if we are to apply this understanding, then it is understood that in order for that to happen, there have to be major realignment of pranic currents. Because these pranic currents fulfill their purpose and in doing so seal, seal everything. Seal. So we have this visceral experience of being alive, of being in the body, as the body. The whole sealed here, the pact, the whole conglomerate, and why am I, why is it called ignorance? Why, why is it in so many traditions, East, West, it totally agrees on that. The identity with the body to such degree that when I say I'm this, I'm that, it's always a reference to the body and its functions. <clears throat> so this needs to be dismantled, dislodged. And it cannot be dislodged at the level of the mind. Mind itself here is subject to the pranic currents. So therefore, that what is taking place when the life force is unleashed is accompanied by a realignment of pranic currents. And the realignment of the pranic currents is in most cases accompanied by the phenomenology of this 
spontaneous movements. So, and even then, we cannot speak about it in clinical terms only. What's important to understand here that it happens at such intricate, refined level that at, on one hand, kriyas are what freeing the system from accumulated impressions. This is how the samskaric field is dismantled. So these kriyas are what allows the process of unplugging to take place. And without that unplugging, the circuit is so strong that it's a wishful thinking to consider breaking free from that what is sealed here by the activity of electrical responses and the functioning of the endocrine system. It's sealed. That's what the will of samsara I call it biological perspective on the will of samsara. You can speak about it in that kind of more traditional cycle of birth and death. But that cycle here is what sets everything in motion and seals everything. Experience, impression, electrical response, hormonal juices issued into the system and circuit set in motion. We've done that. First three years, looked, touched, tasted, smelled, experienced, and then from, for the rest of our lives, is the un un unraveling of all that. So, prior to that, consciousness is malleable. After that, it's only calcifying further and further, crystallizing. So, therefore, that what is morphed needs to be melted. And that's what the unleash of the life force is. So, <clears throat> from one, from this perspective, that is what is being here accomplished. So it has that. It has that purpose. Or a byproduct. Maybe it's even byproduct rather than the purpose. And on the other hand, there's something else happening, and that's more today to that what feels to me personally still as, as nothing short of, of miraculous is where these pranic forces that are not just some clinical activity of bioplasmic movements, which what prana is, but speaking um, equipped with a more traditional understanding, these are expressions of these creative impulses of awareness that expresses itself from behind the scenes in such a way that it gives this visceral experience of you being yourself, me being myself, and having that cherished intimate experience where there is something else going on behind the scene altogether. And only glimpses to that are given when this is unleashed, to what degree? Each to their own. So, and in that process, there is this unfoldment of the language that Goddess herself begins to speak, and the body begins, becomes her expression. So this is why we never speak clinically about Kriyas, because it would be doing tremendous disservice if we only view this as the, unfold, as the unraveling of the samskaric field. Because in my experience, there's it, much more than that. Something else is going on altogether. And that is what we said to redress here in this particular immersion, in a way that hopefully entrance will be given, license will be given. <clears throat> Thank you.